Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with the head coach of University of South Carolina, recruiter extraordinaire, former tour pro, has a win over Stan Wawrinka, former assistant at Arizona State, former assistant at uh, Duke, son of Carlos Goffey, who was very instrumental in development of the John and Patrick McEnroe. Uh, I'm sure he's got a great early story about John. Uh, we're here with Josh Goffey. Josh, thanks for coming to the show. Yeah, thanks, man. That's quite the intro. I feel like I'm ready to walk out of a, a uh, boxing ring here. Right. <laughs> I, feel, I feel ready to go. Yeah, happy to so, be here. So it's fun, funny story is I played at Florida a and and we played Clemson. Uh, and that was the time I think I just missed you. I think we played him in 02. Right. Just missed you. That was at the time we were like the first all black team to be top 50 in the country. Amazing. And the thing I remember about Clemson is you all had other than an HBCU, the most African-American players on the team. You had 100%. Thompson brothers, Jermaine Jenkins, and you all were tough. And I remember uh, Jermaine was in a heated match against, I think, Jerry Joseph. Okay. His brother was Leslie Joseph. Leslie Joseph. Was, I'm yeah. Jerry from South Carolina, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's from Rock Hill, South Carolina. And they were cheating. I mean, it was like <laughs> second serve in the middle of the box, catch the ball out. You yeah. know what I mean? It just was like, <laughs> yeah. and Jermaine sounds, was sounds like, like an intense college match. Oh, it sounds like a typical intense college match. Yeah. Uh, so our worlds almost collided back in 2002, but we didn't. But it's great to connect with you now. Welcome to the show. Yeah, man. Happy to be here. Let's get so you're going to be here in Chicago in right. about two weeks for yeah. the ITA. Yeah, great match again, since he stayed here in the last round of uh, qualifying or round of 32. I made the Sweet 16, which will be hosted by your club up there. Yeah. Um, top 16 teams in the country up there battling it out to see who's going to hold the trophy. Yeah. So your playing career, obviously your dad was Carlos Goffey, who was a world-renowned coach, famous for, um, you know, coaching the McEnroe. So you had it in your blood. You had it in your genes. It was in your face. Yes, uh, I feel sorry for my kids because you got Tennis Channel on all day, every day. Oh, right? They're like, That's great. Daddy, can we turn on – uh, Sonic. And I'm like, no, you need to watch that. That's a forehand. You know what I mean? That's right. That's <laughs> so right. tell us what it was like growing up as a son of Carlos. Yeah, look, I mean, I, it was in my blood. I grew up on the tennis courts, you know, and but my father took and my mother took a different route to development. I mean, I was around the game from the day I was born. I had a guest bed in my bedroom always. And that's where the pros slept. So it wasn't just John. It wasn't just Pat. It was everybody. I mean, the guys that were the Brazilian, top Brazilians used to come in and train with my father in South Carolina. That was their guest bed. So, and these guys were top 100, top 150 in the world as well, and, and many other juniors and so on. So they were just like normal guys, you know, to me. It, it wasn't, I didn't know who they were on the world stage. They were just another guy that was coming in and having dinner with my family and hanging out. And my dad and him would go do whatever. I had no idea what was going on. You know, I would go to school and they'd be there back when I came home and so on. So, you know, it was just around me. And I, there were so many benefits to that. Now, looking back as a coach of understanding from a young age without really, truly understanding it, what high level looked like. Right. So my career as a junior was completely opposite of what most people's were. I didn't play a tournament until I was 14. Mm. I didn't really play tennis more than one or two days a week like maximum until I was about 15, you know, and it was something that my dad knew, like, look, if you're, if you grow up in the game, you have an idea, a vision in your head of what it's supposed to look like at a high level. So you're always trying to, to achieve that. Right. And that was one of the major advantages that I had growing up was that just the language that was being spoken as, as very, just common language, very high level talk about the competition, the competitive side of the game that not a lot of people are privy to. It was, you know, it was basically the same to me as like, how was your day? You know, and I took it for granted for a long time that I was, I was privileged in that sense, you know? So it was, it was great, but it was tennis all the time. My mom was, is an amazing uh, mother and she gave me a lot of bounce in my life, you know, because it was tennis all the time. But, you know, my dad pushed me into soccer a lot. You know, anytime it was like, Hey, Carlos, you know, how's your son doing with the game, you know, and how are your kids? And he goes, nah, man, he's a soccer player, man. He's going to be a soccer player. When he gets 
And, and in a way, it was deflating pressure, which was genius on his part, because mm -hmm. if you're Carlos Gopi's son, one of the great coaches' son, you're, you're supposed to be great. You know, if he can coach somebody else, you're supposed to be the next coming, you know. And so he did an unbelievable job and kept me away from the game. And so it was, it was partially by design, but I legitimately wanted to be a soccer player before. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And a failed soccer career turns into a tennis career, right? Sure. Yeah. They kind of go hand in hand. They're like brother sister sports, you know. They the movements the same. You know, the athletes get along on most college campuses. You know, they they're kind of almost a similar athlete. You know, the mentalities are, are pretty pretty similar, and they get along pretty well. So yeah, I mean, it's they they work well with each other for sure. And 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 contrary to what people believe, those are the biggest sports in the world. You got soccer, which is globally probably the biggest yeah. sports in, biggest sport in the world, and then tennis is more global despite you and I be living in America, That's tennis right. is more global than yeah. the NBA and the NFL. That's right. And baseball. So I, that's why I think the camaraderie is there. When you go to Spain, it is soccer and tennis. That's right. I mean, you look know? at all the pros, man. I mean, look at all. They're, they all played soccer when they were young. Every yeah. single, you know, it's like they're all, look at, look at Rude on some of these behind the scenes things. He's got a little soccer table and he's playing with the header game. And Rafa's right. playing soccer tennis, you know, to start out as a warm up almost every day. It's, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, Look, it, my advice to kids is like, you know, basketball and, and soccer to start, you know, and as, while you're playing tennis. I mean, those sports give you so many, so many intangibles, you know, spatial awareness, being ahead of the play, the footwork, just the athleticism of just being a multidirectional athlete from a young age without knowing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you get you get a camaraderie with your team. I mean, it's, it's healthy for a kid. And, you know, if, so if parents are listening, it's like, Put your kids in those sports all the way until about 12, 13, you know, if they want to, you know, transition to tennis, great. But, but every time they're on one of those courts or those fields, they're getting better at tennis, 100%. You know, the, they're raising their ceiling athletically and also with the intangibles that you need at about 16, 17. Developmentally, they're seeing the game at a much higher level and they can, they can transcend to those levels versus, you know, being capped off if you're just a tennis guy. You know, right. so my dad's a firm believer of that. And I think many, many former pros are as well. Yeah. Like when I, when I sort of advise parents, I always tell them like, when you're on the tennis court, you are learning tennis skills. Yeah. There's a lot of reputation, a lot of discipline, yeah. but you may not be learning to be an athlete. That's right. right? And you can get app and you don't want to pay hourly, you know, 200 bucks an hour for me to like, teach you how to cross over step, run side to side, run at okay. 45 degree, right? Yeah. Track the ball. You can go get that on the basketball court for 15 bucks an hour, right? You know what I mean? So like, you don't want to pay me to give your kid athletic skills. Well, I'm glad that, I'm glad you're saying that because not many people would because that's yeah. a, lot <laughs> a lot of money, right? And, and, I, and I don't have the time, right? I want to spend my time on teaching you how to hit this ball in this spot, That's right? right? This yeah. way. That's great. Um, so, you had early interaction with John McEnroe. Yeah. What was that like? It was great. I mean, he was like, he was just like Uncle John. You know, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, it, I'll tell you the very first time. Here's a funny story. The very first time that I saw John as, oh, that's that's John. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the guy that's number one in the world, you know. And, you know, and he, he was a sweetheart of a guy with me and my family and the whole deal. He's one of the nicest people around. But when you, when I was, we were in the grocery store, I remember probably I was about five. So that would have been like 84, right? Top of the game for Mac. And, and I remember going, and he used to be sponsored by Bic. And I remember walking to the checkout, and there was this huge six-foot cutout of Johnny Mac holding the Bic razor. And I remember looking at my mom and going, hey, there's Mac. That's weird. <laughs> and I looked up at her, and I'm like, why is Mac on the, what? You know, and, she, and then she's just like, yeah. Um, and then we walked to the car and she's like, yeah, so John's like number one in the world at, in tennis. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what? That's amazing. And so, yeah, that's kind of, but that's the familiarity. It was just like, hey, man, you want to go uh, hang out with John and me while we hit some balls? Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So now, was, was he, was he hot tempered back then? I mean, on the court for sure, but you know, people misunderstood John. I mean, yes, John also, John lost control, obviously. I mean, there's been plenty of documentaries. He's spoken on it plenty of times. But no, I mean, like in a familiar setting, man, I mean, the guy was just as chill as can be. He's just, you know, a normal guy, man, you know, but a normal guy that everybody wanted a piece of. And that'll wear on your nerves a little bit, you know, and, and he kept his people that were close in his circle real close. And, you know, it's tough being in that situation, especially back in the heyday. I mean, that was in the tennis boom. I mean, he was, he was a superstar. 
Yeah. You know? So, you know, I've, I've gotten to learn more about his story throughout the years. Obviously, I started reading into it, talking to my dad. My dad's starting to share more stories about, you know, some of the things that went on back then and so on. But, you know, it's you got to feel for a guy, you know, these guys. I mean, there's so much that's given and earned, but but also like, you know, the, the top of the mountain. But everybody wants a piece of it. They just want a little bit of normalcy in their lives sometimes. And I think what's tough about that era is, you know this, right? You got a season, you got 20 hours a week of practice, you put so much into it. And in the pre-Hawkeye day, yep. in the pre-ELC, which is electronic line calling day, mm-hmm. you have so many hours invested in this. Yep. You got a staff of people whose bonuses are tied to this. Yep. And there's so there was so much human error yep. that it will make you crazy. Will. You know what I mean? Like it will, it, but it's part of the game. It's part of the game. I mean, it was part of the game. game. It was part of the game. And you just hope it didn't happen on the largest point of the match. You know, right. <laughs> and, and and you know, there's always one going this way and another one going that way. Sometimes it's it, at thirty all, four all in the third, and it's against you. That's that's unlucky. But you know, and sometimes it's at forty love, you know, one love in the first, and it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, right. it's like man, whatever. You know, right. but, yeah, I mean, there's different times, but look, that's a piece of adversity in the match. You yeah. know. And, and, you know, I think that's something that my dad spoke about a lot and he speaks about a lot. It's something we speak about all the time as, as coaches is, look, I mean, expect that's going to happen. It happens all the time in college tennis. So, like, there's no discussing it once it happens. We know it's going to happen. And it might happen at the worst time. But there's going to be a call here and a call there going the other way, especially if it's one person calling the whole court. You know, if there's some human error on, on actual lines, we're fine. But at the same time, look, it's how you respond to that. And, and knowing it's like, look, that's fine. That's, that's a knock. I, it, 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 you know, that ball, that was in, it should have been my point or it should have, you know, continued momentum I had fine, but it's factual. It happened. There's no changing it. Move on. Now, if you need a, if you need a, if you need a timeout because the match is moving in the wrong direction fast because of that call, that's where Johnny Mack was great. And not a lot of people understood some of those some of those timeouts that he took by by right. uh, getting on an umpire and slowing the match down and creating a spectacle and having the other guy across the net that was on fire go out oh, here John goes again. Right. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't all the time losing temper. I mean, it was he used his reputation to his benefit a lot of times, and I think that's part of being a great gamer or a great competitor. Yeah, it wasn't. It was so subtle that you didn't know what was happening. Now we see it more sort of in your face. Where I got to go to the bathroom. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, now yeah. it's just in your face, right? Yeah. I got the is, yeah. Now, now you're bending the rules. Yeah. Bending the rules. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so you think about college tennis, right? And you obviously qualify for the Sweet 16, Top 16 uh, teams in ITA. So you're at sort of the top of the food chain, right? And building this program. Okay. And historically, college tennis has been the graveyard to a pro career. But most recently, we've seen a lot of people sort of make that transition. Marcos Jerome, Mackie McDonald, Chris Eubanks, now Ben Shelton, right? Talk about now, I look at your team and I see everybody above six feet. Like everyone on your team is six foot and above, right? And in this space where more guys are believing that maybe I need to go do a year or two, right? How does that change your recruiting to and your message to, hey, you're going to come, you're going to get your education, you're going to meet a bunch of Wall Street guys, right? Because tennis gets you in the boardroom where other sports might just get you a job. Uh, tell me, that used to be the message when I was a kid, right? right? You're not going pro, come to college, get a great education, get some internships, network. Right. Now it's like, hey, come play at my school. There's NIL money on the table. And perhaps you never know. Right. You know what happens on a program. Tell me how it sort of reshaped your recruiting. Well, to, to backtrack, it, the reason it's changed is because the game on the professional level took such a massive jump. Okay, and the sports science and the and the, the the care of of an athlete's body has advanced to to the to the extreme professional level. And all the top players are traveling with personal trainers. They're having masseuses. They're constantly working out on the road. Their training load stays high out there. So what that means is that, you know, the the chance of injury is pretty slim these days. They're able to sustain for a bunch, even though the game has gotten probably two times as physical as it was because the ball's moving 
up and out and at a speed that's much faster than it was, say, back in the early 90s or even late 80s, right? So careers are lasting much longer, even though it's gotten that much more physical. So what happens? If you're able to mature and your mind gets, gets better, you learn more about the game with every, every rep you have out there competitively, well, you should get better as long as your body can sustain it. Well, right. that's where the Novaks and the Rafas and the Federers and, and you go on. I mean, you have even, even other guys that have been out there since 18 and now 40 years old, they're still in the top 100. So what did that do? That bottleneck the top end of the game to get into the top 100. I mean, you had to bust the door down now. It wasn't like right. a natural attrition where guys are cycling out. See you. I'm done at 35, 31. Adios. Another guy comes in. There's, there's, you have to bust the door down and beat those guys. That's tough to do. So the game has been, it's been great because the game has been evolving. But what that's done to the lower levels is now it's pushed a lot of the, the guys that would transition at 16, 17, 18 out on the futures tour going, look, man, it takes three, four years right now to even come close to getting into the top 100 if you have the talent, unless you're a superstar, right? So, so with that, the mental and physical grind that that takes on your body, there was like a, a little bit of a, a cycle where great players weren't able to get in, you know, in that whole generation. So a lot of players opted to come in, learn about themselves, mature as, a, as an individual, as a human being, let their body mature, let their mind mature, emotionally get under control as a young you know, man or woman at that age, when you have all of those hormones coming in during college and your body now is like, okay, well, now I kind of understand what I can do. Now let's go give it a shot, right? So it's almost like an incubator for the pro tour in that we've naturally seen that in a way and that's developed just organically in the last, say, eight years, right? Mm -hmm. That's starting to come out with Cameron Nori really becoming the next guy. Isner was there, but, you know, he's 6'10", you know, I mean, it's like you got right. Nori, which is like a normal dude that, that is now a top tenner and, and has proven the pathway quite a bit and, and Mackey and all those guys. So, so now... You know, there's there is legitimately 11, 12 guys in the top 100. You know, you look at us as sort of a federation of of putting putting players out onto the tour in the top 100. You know, we have the most players in the world, you know, as far as if you look at us as a as a unit. So, yeah, I, I think that there's uh, in general, I think the there's there's more focus on the collegiate level from coaches to develop. They feel a responsibility with the level of player coming in and to develop. I think the players are more excited to work on a daily basis to become a pro. So it, it infuses the teams and it motivates coaches to, to really give it everything they have on a daily basis. So you put all those together and this, this synergy starts happening, you know, and there's, there's a lot more coming down the pipe. You know, there's a lot of great players in college tennis right now. So you mentioned college tennis being like an incubator, right? And yeah. I would say broadly, that's, uh, you know, there's a few schools that I think really qualify in that incubator space, right? I think UCLA, USC has historically been seen as like the, the D League, right? Or the G League for yeah. the tour, right? A lot of pros come through there. But South Carolina's got two guys yeah. that Sarundalo and Paul Judd, right. who have had good success on the pro tour, right? Yeah. Talk about how you have gotten those guys on first, how'd you get them, right? And then once you got there, how'd you help them make that transition, right? Because I mean, that's not, you know, uh, yeah. that's not luck and that's not a mistake. So let's talk about Sarundalo first. I remember commentating some of Sarundalo's matches right. and it was like, who is this dude? You know what I mean? Just yeah. won, won a few tournaments in a row. And I'm like, just out of nowhere, right? South yeah. American dude, you're from South America. So I'm yeah. sure that has some sort of uh, connection there. In terms bit, of for sure, yeah. But talk about Sarundalo for a minute. Yeah, Fran, you look, first of all, you know, we, when it comes to recruiting, there's, you have to find your niche. You have to find the way that, the, you know, you have to develop your brand, you know, and that's our brand is, I've, I've been at it for a long time, but it's, Look, I, I want to be known as a developer. I want to be a guy that's like, you want to come, you want to bust it every day and you want me to hold you accountable to the standards of what it's going to take to become a tour player. And this is your school. Like that's, that's the brand that we want to put out there. And it scares the heck out of a lot of people, to be totally honest. It, it moves recruits on that want a general education and they want to have the football stadium and this and that. You know, that's not our brand. It, it sort of out recruits us in a way, but it also makes our, our pool a little smaller. So the other side of it is, is like, you know, Jub and Fran were both, they were unknown players on, on recruiting levels. People were like, 
how did you find out about that guy? How did you find out about that guy? You know, Paul, how did you find out about Fran? You know, my, I had a great assistant. My assistant last time was Kyle Bailey. He's at Charlotte. You know, it came across his desk. Somehow, you know, he went down the rabbit hole. And, you know, we, we look at some of the top players in the world from the country. And then we go, now we're going to go into their federation website. And we're going to get it translated somehow to figure out what it, what it, what it, what it means and all that. And then we're going to check out the results there. Are there players that just don't have the finances to get out of their country and travel on the ITF tour well, and that are competitive with these guys? Well, those are the guys that South Carolina wants because they got a little edge to them. They got a little hunger to them and they got the ability. Right. So we want to go check those guys out. So then we start figuring out those guys. And that's that's where we recruit. We recruit in the shadows. That's where we call it, you know, where nobody really sees it. And then we go down there. So I went down the, the I mean, I watched I went to Buenos Aires to watch to watch Fran play. And I told him, I was like, I, I like the way this guy looks on camera. I, we, we're going. I literally booked a flight the next day. I went down there. He goes, you don't want to come watch me at this club. I mean, it's in the ghetto. Right. <laughs> and I get off the highway, rent a car, get off the highway. And there are, guys, there are policemen with bulletproof vests and sawed-off shotguns on the street that I'm driving down. And, you know, it was it was a poverty-stricken area. And, you know, and we get into this guard gate, and I go there to watch Fran play. And thank God I did because, you know, I went out there and I saw that forehand and I was just like, you know, the guy can move. The guy is a, is a cat on the court. I mean, the balance is off the charts and, and he's super limber, a little bit like Novak in that way. And then I saw the forehand, you know, the rev that he could put on that forehand. I was like, that's different, you know, at worst case. And he wants to get an education at worst case, this guy, you know, we'll see what his hunger level is like to become a great pro, you know, but we'll see. And so we spoke about it a little bit and, and it, things worked out and he decided to come. But, you know, Fran, Fran was a, a heck of an athlete and his father is a great coach. So his foundation, I love, I love, you know, coaches sons and uh, did recruit them as well. That's one of the factors. And, and so a lot of those things lined up for me and we lined up for Fran and, and the deal was done. So how did the trend, how did the decision to turn pro happen? Because, you know, a lot of guys, they went NCAAs, but I'm going pro, right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Ben Shelton was obvious, right? We gave him a wild, we actually gave him a wild card into our 80K. Right. Final our 80K, then yeah, you know, third exactly. round of Cincy, right? And that that yeah. was obvious. But Sarundalo wasn't so obvious. No, no, no. It was actually by just happenstance. I mean, it's it's an unbelievable story. Fran and I are great friends, and you know, his father and I, his family, we're all still very tight. It was, you know, Fran, Latin families are are very tight, they're very close. And Fran, Fran, you know, missed missed his family quite a bit. He was homesick. He was homesick from the day he got here, you know, but he stuck it out. I mean, he was working. We met all the time. He got up to speed as far as training standards. The guy did everything to move his level forward. He was giving it a legitimate go, but the, you could see that he was very sad. You know, it, it was, it was real. And he tried, I mean, he stuck it out and then he went home for, for Christmas break. And that's when we knew, you know, I mean, the guy was there with all his boys and his family. And, and it's just like, I belong in Argentina. It wasn't, it wasn't an us thing. It wasn't, it was a, it was, this is where I belong coach, you know? And we, so we had a candid talk. He came back, gave it a go and uh, played all the way through national indoors and said, I can't do it, man. You know, I love you, but I can't do it. And he went home just to go study. He enrolled in the university of Buenos Aires back home and wasn't going home to be a pro, but you know, I called Toto, his dad, and I said, look, you know, I, a friend needs to give it a go. His training standards have gotten up to speed. Like, what he's doing with the ball right now is is different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it'd be really cool to see him continue. But Because I know that Juan Mai, his younger brother, Juan Manuel, was top 10 in the world at 16, you know, in juniors. Like, he's a very good player as well. But I said, but this guy, this guy has a few things here that, you know, it, it would be worth exploring here. And he said, yeah, you know, okay, we'll see what he wants to do. You know, very relaxed as a father, and and Fran ended up playing a future in his in <laughs> an hour away from his hometown, and he went out there and did well. And he goes, yeah, you know, it's okay. I kind of like it. Let's see if it goes. I'm actually pretty good at this thing. Goes to the next one, and so on. We connect. You know, I congratulated him, and then and then we connect, and he goes, look, I, you know, I do want to I do want to thank you for giving me this opportunity because you know I I like to train now. I like to be here. It's it's not as hard as I thought it is. So I'm going to give it a go. And, you know, for me as a coach, that made, made my heart full of like, okay, man, this guy's going to give it a go, whether he's here in South Carolina or whether he's playing professionally in Argentina, it's besides the point. The guy, the guy was able to realize his dreams, you know, and they were different than what he thought they were going to be, you know, as far as 
you know, I would like tennis and I'll play casual, but it's, you know, the guy is now 20, got to the high of 26, 28 in the world or whatever it is. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then Paul, Paul Jubb. So I remember being at Wimby. I saw Paul Jubb, obviously, you know, um, British players get the wild card. I saw him play. I was like, oh, okay, this kid's not bad. A little, little slim. Yeah. Fiery. Yeah. Wiry. Right. We can use, you know, can use the bottom edge of the racket, can chip, can do a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Got a little swagger to him. Yeah. Uh, and I actually tried to get Tennis Channel to do like a story on, like a feature on sort of his story. So tell me about how you found um, Paul Joe. I mean, obviously most college coaches go to the junior slams, you know, see who doesn't win it, right? Because if you win it, you're probably going pro, right? right? You want the guy that like quarters or, be, or, or you know, south of that. Yeah. Um, tell me about the recruiting thing, the recruiting trip for that. Well, look, man, Job, Job never, never played a slam. Jubb never played in Roehampton. I mean, he was a British player and didn't get the wild card. <laughs> and that's where Paul Jubb came from, you know, right. and that's, that's this story in itself is, should be, should be motivating to anybody, you know, that's out there that wants to be a good player, just because you're not in the, in the cream of the crop by the time you're 17 and you're in your country and you, you know, you're not getting the, the walkthrough of wild cards. Like, it doesn't mean that you can't be great. You know, it's like, there's many stories like that. And Paul's just one of them. But I went over there to recruit a, a Scottish player that I had thought that I was going to get the commitment for at Roehampton. His mom uh, drove down from Scotland and decided, you know, it was going to be there. And, and we were ready to uh, ready to kind of work out the scholarship and so on. But it was that was the meeting was set. I went there for that and I was going to watch some other guys. And fast forward about 20 minutes into me arriving at the site, I see another coach. That was basically like pals, like boys with the Scottish players coach. And I was like, that's not good. That's not right. good. That's not, that's not a good vibe that I'm feeling right now, you know, about walking in here. I just flew across the pond, got in at 6 a.m. I came here to do it and I was, you know, jet lagged. And I'm, and I'm like, that's not what I want to see right now, you know? And, <laughs> and so uh, I go and meet with mom and mom says, look, I'm sorry. But things changed in the last, it, literally in the last 12 hours. I go, that's amazing that something changed in the last 12 hours. And she goes, yeah, well, this coach was coached, was also one of the head coach's players. And now he's coaching in college and it's a natural fit. And, and I think that we're going to go to this school. And at that point, I'm sitting there going, man, I just flew literally across the pond. And, and now I'm just here and I got to hustle. So I went in and, and needed some caffeine at that point. I went into the cafeteria at the uh, NTC over there in Roehampton at the, at the LTA's training center. Yeah. Got a little espresso. And one of my friends slash, you know, a guy I knew in the Federation, James Trotman says, Hey mate, you know, I heard about this player. He's a British player. I knew about this player. And I'm sorry, sorry to hear that. I knew you were coming here for that reason. There, you know, let's go have a coffee. So we go have a coffee and he goes, look, there's, there's a kid. He's not here, but he's good. You know, there's something there. And that was his quote. There's something there. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something there. It might be worth your time, but you got to get a train up the hole. He's there. I just called him and he's fine setting up a practice and, and you coming in. He's young. He's only 16 right now, but he doesn't want to go to his fourth year in, in high school. He wants to elect to get out and go to college. It's his only pathway. He has no other options. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, cause we're not funding him. The squeeze is happening. We're not going to fund him next year. He doesn't have another pathway to continue playing tennis. College is the only way. So I talked to the women's assistant at the time, Jeff Navolo, now it's SMU, and he's like, Goffey, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Like, there's, there's no matches tomorrow on the Sunday? Like, come on, like, what are you going to do? Go get a train. Right. So I wake up super early, get the four and a half hour train up the hall, take a cab over to the site, wait three hours there to see him come in and play, watch him play. And I go, ah, I mean, the guy can move. He's <laughs> light on the court. Strokes are okay, you know? And, and I was like, well, you know, I don't know. I was looking for a horse and, you know, a 16 year old kid that was 120 pounds wet, you know, wasn't a exactly <laughs> horse that I was looking for. So, so we, you know, I, I go and I meet with him afterwards and, you know, and say hi, you know, whatever. And, you know, appreciate you letting me come up here, not thinking much of it, but the conversation that I had with him definitely raised the stock. Didn't sell me, but it raised the stock in my eyes of like, all right, you know, maybe Trotman's right. There is something here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jubby told me, he goes, look, man, he goes, I don't come for much. You know, sat, I remember sitting on the court. I don't come from much, you know, I've never gotten anything from anybody. The only guy that's given me anything in my life is this guy. 
and that was the guy that was that was Johnny. And Johnny is the guy that literally picked him up from school every day and brought him to the courts. Jubby did his homework. And when Johnny was done with his lessons, he would work Jubby out since he was like six. Mm -hmm. And it was basically like his dad. And so, and Johnny was my age, you know, but just had a, had a place for Jubby in his heart. And he goes, without this guy, you know, who knows where I'd be right now? Probably not in, not doing very well in anything. So he said, he goes, look, if I had the same as everybody else, I'd be the best. I can guarantee that. Hmm. And I've heard that plenty of times, but I didn't hear it with that sort of intensity any other time than, what, than when Jubby said it. Jubby said it with like a piercing intensity. And that was the, the chip on the shoulder that I was like, there's something there. That'll, that'll keep this kid running. That'll keep this kid going back for more every day. No matter how much he gets, he's going to keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And so from there, that was like, all right, that's an intangible that might be a separator for this guy. Now, he's going to have to get put some weight on. We're going to have to get through the ball a little bit more. We're going to have to develop that serve a little bit. Get in the weight um, room. Yeah. You know, but, but, but look, I mean, 16, you don't really know. He was underdeveloped for a 16-year-old. So maturity and time and the body and all that stuff comes, it comes in time. That's part of the reason why college athletics is so great because it's a way, it's a place for your body to develop. It's a place yeah. for your mind to develop. It's a place for you to learn about yourself and you know, develop your own individuality as a person. All those things go hand in hand with being a successful player. So that is the incubator when I talk about it. It's like as player development, just some things that na happen naturally during this time without coaches input. Right. You know, there's growth regardless. Now you had a good coach and somebody that cares about development that understands standards on the back end. You get a kid that has that chip on the shoulder or is motivated to become a pro. Guess what? That kid is going to work. That kid's going to go there. It's going to happen because those things start coming around. And if somebody has a good perspective of the journey of what it looks like out on tour and what that ball speed needs to look like, what that rotation needs to look like, what the fundamentals physically, technically, and mentally have to be to be a professional player. You can hold those standards over to the guy as long as he's pushing that gas pedal down and driving his own car. You can guide as a coach. There's not a better place to do it because the pressures of earning a living are not here. Right. The pressures of earning a living out in the futures where there's kids out there that are not as dedicated as a lot of the college players that don't have the structure that the college players are provided. Those guys get lost out there. And then there's the mental torment of I'm not doing well enough. I'm a failure. Whereas in here, yeah, you're winning matches for your team and you do it for the school pride, but that's something that's bigger than you. It's not about you. And so when you're going out there, you're going to work for your boys. You're going to work for yourself, also your team, also for the coaches that are putting it in there and also for the school that's giving you so much. So there's so many of these intangibles that, that come with this, this pot of four years, two years, three years, however long the player needs to stay here, that, that are the building blocks to be successful out there. Yeah, I think what I, I look at the women's tour and I say a girl becomes a woman sooner, right? Yeah, so you look at the Fumi Tovers on it, sisters, you're 16, 17. Physically, you can compete, right? But a boy becomes a man a lot later and pro tennis is a man's game. That's right. And sometimes you need a place to go and find shelter and find food and find 20 hours a week yeah. with other guys that can hit the ball as big as you, right? That can push you with a coach that's going to be your dad, right? Who's financially incentivized to help you succeed and keep right. you out of trouble, right? Sometimes you need a place to go somewhere and become a man. Because if you get on tour and you got to play Novak and you got to play Rude or somebody like that, those are men. You know what yeah. I mean? And so yeah. college tennis is a great place to go for a couple of years, even if it's four, and become a man. Yeah. And on top of that, you want to talk about a coach. The difference between a college coach and a professional coach or a junior coach is the players aren't paying us. The play, we're not working for somebody. Right. right. So the thing about that is that we can be very objective. We don't have to know where our next meal is coming from. The school's paying us. Right. So a lot of times what unfortunately what happens out on tour is when, you know, what relationships can get, can get stunted because, you know, the truth hurts. That people don't like to hear what they need to do is the truth, you know, and tennis players are phenomenal at faking themselves out. I mean, that's what we do for our living. We fake the guy out across the middle of what we're feeling inside. Yeah. You know, we present confidence. Sometimes we start believing it too much versus addressing what's necessary, you know, and that's what, you know, the great coach, Tony Nadal, that's what he does. I mean, he's like to the point and good coaches, you know, are there to, you know, I'm here to tell you when you're great, 
when it's good, but I'm also telling you what you need to improve on because that's what we want to do. We want to get better. We want to grow constantly. So when we do it wrong, it's an opportunity to get better. So in a, as in a college system, yes, we're not, we're not telling people all the time what they need to be better in, but at the same time, you know, we don't have to protect that next paycheck. Right. That unfortunately, get, you know, that coaching relationships gets compromised. We don't have to compromise that in college. So we just get to talk to our team the way it is and what needs to get better. And as long as they know that we care for them and truly love them deeply as individuals and enjoy seeing them grow, you know, it's direct feedback and they love, it. you know, it's hard to hear sometimes, but, but, but they need it and they love it. That's the beautiful part about, about another, another beautiful part about college things. Yeah. I think that's so, you know, from a, you know, somebody that's coached on tours, eight, nine, nine, nine years now, it, that is the hardest part yeah. is, bossing your boss around in essence the player is the boss they're That's the boss right. of the agent oh, they're the boss of parent at the time they're the boss of everybody the trainer and the years where you have the most success is when i don't like to use the word control but when the coach is financially free to say what needs to be said 100%. and the player is willing to hear it knowing it comes from a place of shared incentive yeah. right and I think that that's the hardest part about coaching at in the pros is that the is. freedom to say what needs to be said yep. to somebody that pays your check. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. You know what I mean? Look, for, fortunate for me, I've always had the ability to walk, you know, to to not depend on the check so much, right? Like, yeah. never you know, been in a situation where I need your check to eat. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, look, you got to do what's right. And I think anybody that is successful in any industry, they're, they're always willing to, to walk when they need to, you know, yeah. because they're valuing. That's what a coach does at all times. Yeah. Sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes it's not pretty. But at the same time, it's something that's necessary. And a coach that's willing to do that is the coach that is always going to be most successful, you know. And once that relationship gets compromised, there's no trust. Once the trust is gone, look, it's not going to work out anyways. I'm not going to be able to give you what you want. And, and so therefore, what's the point here, right? And it, I always say, either way you're screwed, right? If I don't tell you the truth, we're going to lose. And if you lose, I'm out, right? Yeah. So I might as well just go ahead and say what needs to be said because at the end of the day, winning solves everything. Yeah, it's crazy, but it, it is true. Unfortunately, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but, you know, if the basis of your relationship is, is trust and, and there's a genuine care and they feel that, then you can speak, you can speak the truth. And I think with any great coaching in professional sports, college sports, you know, whatever you see that, you see coaches can get on their players and they're, when the, you can tell the way that the player will respond to that, to that moment, whether they take it and they, it hurts them, but if they take it and, and there's no lip, they just go and they're just like, right, let's go. And then the next day, guess where they're going to be? They're going to be out there practicing. They're going to go out there. They're not going to wait for coach to call them and say, come on in. That player is going to call coach and be like, I'm going to see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning or 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. We're getting this done before the next time we compete. That's happening. Mm -hmm. That's a relationship. That's a coach going, this is the standard. This is the level. This is where you fell short. And that player goes, I love that. Thank you so much. I want to know that because it's not that I don't want to be great. I just don't know how to be great because I've never done it before. As a coach, you've seen the pathway. You've been there. You've seen players go through, do it the right way. You've seen players go the wrong way. As a former player, you can provide perspective into the journey of your own journey of seeing all the players that did it wrong, that did it right, and all of your own mistakes and all your own successes, right? All of those different perspectives can play in, and that's where the trust and the validation comes in in that relationship. You know, that's that's ultimately where it needs to be. You know, yeah. these players that are that want a yes man, or they want somebody that's going to whatever, go get a friend, go get a travel partner. That's cool. Do what Nick does. You know, curious. I mean, like, get your boy. Right. You know, like that's if, if that's what you want, go get your boy. You know, like get somebody that's gonna take care of you. That's got your best interest as a human. Fine. That's your yes, man. That's your boy, you know. But if you want a coach, the coach is there to do X. Let him coach. And you see the players that go back to the same person and go ahead and go back. That's that's because the trust is there. You go back to someone you trust when you know you need to hear it, right? And you know where to go when you know you need to hear it. Right. So let me ask you this question. You, I look at like schools like South Carolina, Florida, UCLA, and Georgia even, right? And those schools are historically football schools, yep. right? Bigger yep. sports, revenue producing sports. And 
you know, globally in tennis, we are always trying to elevate our profile. And even though we're more global than the NBA NFL, we're still competing for dollars and all the t- airtime and TV time that they get that we don't. Right. College tennis at one of those schools is like a microcosm of that sort of struggle. Yeah. How do you, I mean, having, having had Paul Job who won NCAAs, right? Very successful program, now top 20 in the country, right? How do you try to create pride and branding in a school that is known as a football school in the SEC? It's a journey like anything else, you know? I mean, you, you put together a plan as a coach of, you know, what the 30,000 foot view of what you want your program to look like. You know, it's the same thing we do with our players with developmental plans. I mean, we have a developmental plan for our program, you know, that I share with my staff. And we have staff meetings, just like we have player meetings every week. You know, are we on our pathway to reach where we want to go? We want to be known as one of the best. I'm not interested in necessarily winning a national title. That's not what I'm doing this for. You know, it's we have different motives about why we want to be successful and so on. But, you know, when when it comes to carving out a piece of the pie in the Gamecock brand, as far as like, well, that's a, that that can be branded as a as a tennis school also or whatever it is. I mean, that's a consequence of doing a thousand things right on top of each other, you know, and, and so. I'm not in the business and, I, and it's not the way we talk. It's not the way we, we, we preach or do things in our program. You know, we don't ask for things that we haven't earned. And I think that is something that, that we, you know, that's fundamental in anybody that's going to go a long way. You know, if you're nobody, when you start to become somebody, it starts with the first step. You know, I think it's the second step. You know, don't ask, well, I need X. I don't know. We don't deserve X. We don't have X. We aren't, we haven't proven that we deserve X. Mm-hmm. So we got to go out there and start developing players, not just in the, in, on the tennis court, but, you know, our earliest successes were in the classroom. We had, we had SAC, which is the student athlete advisory committee. We had presidents, back-to-back presidents. We had vice presidents that were in charge of all the student athletes. They led the community inside the athletic administration for the athletes. That was a first point of, Hey, we develop people. Hey, that tennis team is doing some cool things. They're developing people. They're not very good on the tennis court yet, but they're developing people. So that was step one. That was a controllable that could be attained very quickly. It's recruiting a quality individual that wants to succeed. Their tennis skills or athleticism might not have been up to speed to be top 10 in the country, but as an individual, they were top class. So we started there. Recruit the person first. Recruit a top-end individual and let them shine, and we'll push them into the industry. And now they're working in some of the biggest banks and financial institutions, and they're killing it. We have a, one of the best comedians on TikTok right now. We got people that want to be great, you know. And that was it. And then from there, you know, every year you can recruit a little bit better because those kids busted their butts, and then I, they got the program one step closer. Then the recruiting level got a little bit better, and so on and so forth. And it's one step forward, and we're going to keep walking forward until we can't walk anymore. And we'll see how that goes. But right now, the level of recruits we're able to get in, you talked about the six foot at, you know, studs that we have. We have big boys. I mean, you know, but it's not a brand that we're looking for. They just happen to be the guys that, that we recruited. They're great kids we're built on it. They're studs in the classroom. They're studs everywhere. We have a brand that's exceptional. It's exceptional every, every moment of your life. Excellence is not a sometimes thing. It's an every second of every day thing. We talk about that all the time. The way you keep your room, the way you walk to class, the way you pay, pay attention in class, the way you keep your grades, the way you walk here, the way you keep your locker, the way that you is. If you're tidy outside of the court, you're tidy inside the court. Your decisions are on point in the biggest moments. You're yeah. organized. Your brain is, is coming into a focus. All of those things start with the individual. If you get a kid that can't get there or he has an upbringing that gives him a little bit too much scattered energy, it's tough to rein that in. Mm-hmm. So, so when we're out there watching guys compete, I love fire. I'm not worried about a kid throwing a racket or, or losing his temper on the court. That's fire. That's passion. Now, we got to see if the kid can control it. And then now all of a sudden, that's, that's an engine that will run. And so, you know, that's you're talking about moving something forward here. We've done that. You know, we're still not where we want to be. But, but Gamecock Nation is taking taking notice. The ITA is starting to take notice. College coaches are taking notice. You know, I get a couple of texts here and there. Not sure what you're doing over there, but whatever it is, keep doing it. Yeah. You know, I get that one a decent amount. You know, it's noticeable that your guys are getting better. I mean, God, that makes me that makes my heart full, man, when I as a coach, you know. But 
But most importantly, these, these kids are kicking butt everywhere in their lives, you know, and, and as a freshman, they're not, you know, they have to, they have to come in. But part of another great part about college tennis, not to bump college tennis here, but man, it's like Montessori system in school. I got a kid that well, one of my own kids is in the Montessori school system. And, and so for people that don't know what that means is they combine grade levels. So like grades one, two, and three are together and then four and five are together. And what it does is it, it teaches like mentorship at a young age. Well, in a college team, you're going to have seniors, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen typically on the team. So as a freshman comes in, they're coming from their own environment with their parents, their coaches, wherever city they are, right? It is like, it's their environment that has shaped them. They really didn't have too much of a say. They got their own identity, their own personality, but a lot of that's been molded by the people that have given it to them. When they come here, it's their first opportunity to get, to really go, thanks mom, dad, coach, you know, Chicago. I appreciate, you know, everything that you've given me. And here's the greatness in it. And then they start looking around at all their teammates and all the other athletes and all the people they rub shoulders with over here. And they go, man, these guys are great at these things. And I'm maybe not as seasoned or whatever. They look at that as a negative or do they have kids on their team going, Hey man, this is the way we do things here. You know, it's okay. So just cause you don't know, doesn't mean that you're deficient and you just don't know. And that's okay. You've got this, what's great about you. Now let's go and build this. And so now you have this Montessori system inside a team that, that really nurtures growth, right? Because those kids that are seniors and juniors got nurtured as young ones too, and so on. And then they have to develop that sort of part of the repertoire of mentorship. You know, they have to be able to, to teach and not just receive. So it's this beautiful combination. So when you walk out of this, out of this, you know, incubator that we've been calling it, man, I mean, you're pretty much ready to go at, go and tackle anything, you know, and the tour is just like, let's go. You know, you look at things in a much more mature way. Yeah. So you've been very generous with your time. Before I let you go, I got to ask you about your win over Stan the Man Wairinka. Man, I was so, <laughs> you know, I was in Torino in 04. You know, it's crazy. I just rubbed, I just came back. I just saw Matthias Boker, right, from Georgia back in the day, one of the all-time college greats. Got to yeah. about 140 in the world. You know, had a good career out there, got injured. But, you know, we were in Torino, Italy. And he was there watching my match against Stan. And I just saw him down in Miami a couple weeks ago when we were playing. And he goes, Josh Goffey, the man that beat Stan. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he goes, I remember Torino. That's the only reason why I remember Torino. It wasn't a great place for me, but I remember you beat him there. That was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, you know, look, things line up, man. Even a blind squirrel can find a nut every now and then, right? But hey, that's, was, that's a great one for your team. Like, man, you think you something, man, I'd be Stan Wawrinka. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. No, look, there's, you know, there was, there was some good, there was some highlights back in the playing days, but there was a, uh, I knew he was much better than me from the ground. So I kept point shorts, even though it was on red clay. I mean, it was one of those tactically and strategically, it was a very well run match by me. It was almost a flawless match and it wasn't really, you know, it had to be one of his worst days, but he was on the phone <laughs> too. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, he was young. He was, he was 18, 19. He was one of the best juniors in the world and he was coming up. Everybody knew he was going to be one of the next guys. And I think that's why I think there was some attention drawn to that match, but but uh, yeah, one of the highlights for sure, man. Well, you know, take it, take it with you, baby. Take it with you. <laughs> yeah, indirect wins, man. I got a couple of slams, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Oh man, if only no, I was like four inches taller and got started earlier and yeah. had a better coach, I would have been Stan. You know, and hit. That's, right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stan's the man. We got to we got to play some doubles together uh, on tour, and you know, he's got what he's a lovely guy, man. That he um, and, and we became pretty close out there for a little bit, you know, when we were out there together and. Um, but he's the man. What a career. Yeah. What a career. Well, thank you for joining, man. This has been the, uh, the Tennis.com podcast with Josh Goffey, head coach for the University of South Carolina, and the man I'll be seeing in Chicago in two weeks. Thanks for joining. All right, All right man. Look forward to seeing you.